This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. This podcast is sponsored by The Forward. Stay up to date with unlimited access to news, culture, and opinion all through a Jewish lens. And for our listeners, for 2NJB listeners, get six months of The Forward for only $10. That's 67% off. An exclusive subscription offer for our listeners, forward.com slash 2NJB, and get six months for 10 bucks. Also in collaboration with Arutz Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com. And last but not least, in collaboration with Australian Jewish News, check them out at ajn.timesofisrael.com. He's been nicknamed Europe's last dictator by much of the media. He's been in power for over 24 years. He's suppressed and even arrested much of his political opposition. And he just prevailed through his fifth electoral consecutive win, but many, if not most, question its legitimacy. Can you guess which head of state we're talking about? Alexander Lukashenko has been the president of Belarus since 1994, and today the country seems like it might be on the brink of a revolution. Shalom Bogos... Bagu- I told you. <laughs> Boguslavsky. I said it right before the show, but I had to get it wrong. Shalom Boguslavsky organizes uh, study tours in Eastern Europe. He writes and lectures about both Eastern Europe and Israel with a focus on geopolitics and Jewish history. We're happy to be joined today by Shalom to talk about the situation in Belarus. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking. <laughs> How are you? Fine, thank you. So so can you like set the stage? Give us a little bit because I'm sure... What the hell is going yeah, on? Yeah, people. some people have probably, I mean, never heard of Belarus you know, who, what is Belarus? What's going on? Give us a little bit of, even going far as far back as the USSR, and just give us a um, quick rundown. We're going to go far back much more than the USSR, okay. because in, in, in that area of the world, uh, like in the Middle East, you, you need to understand some history, uh, because if you don't understand the history, you don't understand why people are doing the stuff they're doing. You don't have the and context. Exactly. Yeah. So... We'll give like two or three minutes about ancient history, okay? And um, we have to understand, first of all, that uh, uh, Belarus is not little Russia. It's not white Russia, okay? okay. Uh, they're not kind of little kind of Russians. Um, <laughs> and it's, it is white, but it's not Russia, but it is Rus. And we have to understand that uh, all the Eastern Slavic n- nations and tribe, uh, they called or were called Rus. And in the Middle Ages, it's going to be relevant in a minute, okay? In the Middle Ages, they had kind of a huge polity uh, that uh, includes today's uh, Belarus, uh, most of Ukraine, and Western Russia. And it was destroyed uh, in the late, in the middle of the 13th century. Now, here... It's, what it's, was this destroyed? The, this polity, this like kind a, of... A, an entity, a, like, a, oh, like a, say, a a A state, okay? okay? Uh, was actually principalities that were united. Historians call them often uh, Kiev and Rus because Kiev, today's capital of the Ukraine, uh, was um, was the capital of that state. And when it was destroyed in the 30th century, it divided in two. And here it becomes to uh, uh, becomes very relevant because the eastern part. When was this that was divided? Uh, late uh, the middle of the 13th century. Ah, okay. Okay. Now the eastern part. Uh, was conquered by the Mongolians. Mm. And from the eastern part emerged Russia later, okay? The western half, that includes Belarus and Ukraine, was conquered by Lithuania and Poland, uh, which were united later in the Lithuanian-Polish Commonwealth. Okay, so we have uh, basically uh, one ethno-linguistic cultural group that was divided in two. Mm. And so this line of division until today, from the uh, Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south, it's kind of geopolitical, uh, I would say, you know, sometimes you have kind of a, a fracture. You know, Fault like, line. Yeah, you have yeah. kind of geological lines when, you know, every movement gonna uh, 
cause earthquakes. Yeah. So we have the same thing, but geopolitical, okay? okay. So uh, why is it important? Because if we look on the pictures that are coming from Belarus, we see that uh, uh, the opposition is using a flag. And in a few minutes, I guess we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna tell what exactly is happening. But we see kind of flag, red and white. Okay, quite similar to the Polish flag. Actually, it's more similar to, it, it is the symbol, it is the flag of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Okay, so what the hell is the, you know, the connection? <laughs> We're talking of Belarus. Why is it Lithuania? Okay, yeah. because Belarus used to be part of the Duchy of Lithuania for 500 years, and only 200 year, years they, they were part, some kind of controlled by Russia. Okay? First the Tsar, and then... So from the 13th century until the 19th, they were part of the uh, Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth. And only in the 19th century, they started to be kind of, uh, um, I would say, uh, occupied or by Russia. Proxy. Exactly. Part of Russia, part of Russian Empire, later part of the Soviet Union. Like a tributary, sort of? Like not necessarily part of the country itself, but they paid taxes or well, whatever? Well, uh, in the beginning, it was the Russian Empire. It means Russia plus uh, Ukraine, part of Poland, uh, Warsaw was uh, part of Russia. So it's, it's part of the Russian Empire. Okay, And later, when the empire collapsed because of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution mm -hmm. in 1917, Uh, Belarus tried to gain independence, like many other parts, including Ukraine, and but it wasn't successful. So uh, they be became part of uh, of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Now, and so if you look on the flag of Belarus, the official flag, the flag of the regime, and the supporters of the regime, this is the flag of the Socialist Soviet Republic of Belarus. Which, you know. Almost, you know, almost the same flag, very similar one. Okay, so um, one of the things that is uh, are interesting in that story that uh, we have the same question that has been asked for almost thousand years: Is this country is going to the west or is it going to mm -hmm. the east? Okay, but Belarusians uh, don't like that question because they would say, you know. Forget about the geopolitics. We want a decent life for ourselves. We're not uh, for Europe and against Russia. We're not for Russia and against Europe. We want democracy. We want normal life. We want decent life. We want to be respected. And um, they don't have that now? And they don't have it. What they have is uh, uh, Lukashenko, which is the last dictator of Europe, as everybody says. Well, this is a question, of course, because uh, what is Europe and what is dictatorship, right? Because mm -hmm. we have uh, Putin. And what is last? Exactly. So <laughs> Maybe there's exactly. more to come. We, we have Putin, which um, I, I'm not sure that Russia is Europe, and I'm not sure Putin is dictator, because Putin is kind of a postmodern tyrant, okay? But, uh, but Lukashenko is, uh, is not postmodern. He's a kind of a Soviet, old school. Nostalgic. Exactly. Yeah. He's kind of old school dictator with a mustache. You still have Lenin statues in. Yeah, of course. The, 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 and Stalin of, also. I plenty think. of Even Soviet. Stalin. Might be, and plenty of Soviet vibes. The thing is, is, is not exactly Soviet, okay? Lukashenko is not Stalin, but uh, he was uh, one of the supporters of uh, Gorbachev in the 80s. Mm. And Gorbachev wanted to preserve the Soviet Union in a kind of lighter version. He wanted to kind of more liberal version of the Soviet tyranny. And it, it, it wasn't successful. But because, in the end, he's the one that broke it apart. No? Well, he didn't mean to because he <laughs> wanted to, to preserve it, but he couldn't handle it. And it, yeah. it, it was broke apa broken it apart. It imploded. And the only place where the, the plan of Gorbachev to have a Soviet state you know, in the more kind of modernized version is Belarus under Lukashenko. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1996, uh, when he was elected, and the first time he was actually elected, uh, on the second round, he actually got 80% of the votes. Uh, but that was the last free elections in Belarus. So, I, I mean, the, the Iron Wall came down when? The Berlin Wall 91. came down in 91, right? Yeah. So in 91 till 94, what was going on in Belarus? It was an a independent state. Yeah. Um, was it democratic? Well, it was an attempt to build a democracy like in all the kind of uh, post-Soviet states. But... But usually it wasn't successful because when uh, the Soviet Empire kind of collapsed, um, what you had actually kind of anarchy. 
uh, you have uh, plenty of crime and, and mafia and and you had kind of uh, extre- extremist organizations and you name it. it was all very, the oligarchs came to be and, that and time. the oligarchs that kind of emerged and they, they had their own kind of uh, uh, collaborations with former K- KGB agents and whatever okay so it was very very difficult time for the people and uh, Lukashenko came and he kind of made the things more or less fine. The people that support him, mostly uh, older people, um, if you ask them why, why do you support a dictator, they would say, okay, because we remember the 90s. The 90s, Divinoste, in the post-Soviet kind of uh, area, it's, it's something that you, you say the word and you know it's kind of, whoa. It's dark okay, times. Okay, you don't want to get back to that mess of the uh, first half of the 90s. So fear is what Fr- I would say so to... so he kind of uh, stabilized uh, uh, the country but he I would say he stabilized it too much okay because I would say that today in uh, 2020 when you know you have the internet and people see how people live in Europe and and they have a decent high-tech industry in, in Belarus and and they say okay why should we live in some kind of Soviet mu- museum in If we can have a decent democratic state but is it Soviet is it socialist like economically or is it a capitalist state because as you mentioned they have a high-tech and I remember I had a friend from an old job that that was from Belarus and he said the high-tech industry there is pretty booming you get yeah. a pretty good salary if you're a developer or you I mean you It's nice. Well, I, I think we, we're not going to go to definitions of what socialism is. Yeah. Um, but um, about, I would say, 80% or almost 80% of the, econo- uh, of the economic system is controlled by the state. Controlled ah, slash wow. owned by the state. Okay? And taxes? So, like what percentage um, of your income goes to um, the... I'm not sure about that. Okay. But, but basically, you have some kind of a private sector. You have some... Uh, uh, some market economy uh-huh. that was the idea of Gorbachev okay to have some market economy okay not all of it's supposed to be owned by the state but most of it still is and they have this kind of old school industry of kind of uh, of tractors this is the fetish of uh, Lukashenko he kind of he's very John Deere f- he's very fond of uh, tractors and agricultural machinery and um, and you have so kind of this uh, steel uh, kind of uh, factories and And all that stuff and you you have also this uh, booming uh, uh, IT high-tech. and, and yeah. high-tech uh, industry uh, so I wouldn't call it socialist but uh, but you have kind of a um, way wage... quote democratic socialist and uh, no because it's not democratic and wow. and here is here is <laughs> the the thing okay uh, all the elections but the first one were uh, forged and And how do so tell us more about that like how do how do they know what was what happened in all of them the thing is uh, how do you forge an election it's it's not uh, that you just uh, write the results that you want usually um, people are voting but um, you know you first of all you kind of uh, you, you prevent some people to vote and you kind of uh, and you influence the voting Someone stations. Someone comes and you tell them, uh, oh, you voted already, sir. Yeah, you, you, you can't you have, come you in. Kind of, you, you take a lot of tricks and you use all of them. And the most important tricks is that you don't let any competition to appear. And here is the thing that starts the mess that we are in right now. Because, uh, because usually if you have someone Uh, from the opposition that is remotely have any chance of actually challenging the the uh, the president he will just be um, disqualified uh, and sometimes arrested for something okay mm-hmm. now so people presume that okay Lukashenko won by 75 or 80 percent so people would say okay we know that he, he didn't win in for 80 percent but he probably got 55 or 60 he would win anyway so you know okay you No, which a, is not a good place to be it's like yeah okay maybe 20 percent here yeah, there so he exaggerated he roughly but, won <laughs> but he he actually won because uh, nobody 
Nobody has beaten him, okay? Presented now, and, him, yeah. and, and that is exactly the difference between the last elections and the, the previous election, because in those elections, he actually, probably, as far as we know, he, he, he lost, okay? And to whom? And in a minute, okay. and, and the official uh, numbers were that he won for 80%, and nobody believed that, and uh, Lukashenko knew that nobody would believe it. So what actually happened to whom he's lost? Um, that was... But the woman, no? Yeah, that's the thing that insulted him the most because he's, he's kind of a macho, okay? He has a mustache, he likes tractors and, you know, goes around with a Kalachnikov and, and uh, he lost to a woman who is kind of a housewife, I would say, that never engaged in politics before. Uh, the thing is, he, he got rid, of course, of his uh, uh, competition, and he had uh, uh, three nominees that were kind of a challenge, okay? And he got rid of all three of them, okay? Two of them uh, he locked up, and uh, the third one is just disqualified. And, uh, and the thing <laughs> yeah. is, one of scary, the scary one of the uh, disqualified and uh, locked up uh, candidates was uh, Serhei uh, Sir Tchernovsky. Mm -hmm. He is a YouTuber. Okay, he has a political blog, um, kind of a position blog, and he was uh, disqualified and locked up. And then his wife, Svetlana Tsikhanovska, uh, she kind of uh, went and registered as a candidate. Now, Lukashenko didn't bother even to disqualify her because, you know, she's nobody. Okay, she, she's a housewife, used to be a teacher and translator to, to English. You know, there's no way that some, 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 someone like her can be possibly a challenge. Uh, so he said, okay, you know, you, you're welcome to, to challenge me. I heard that he claimed at one point, though, that the Constitution what, didn't allow for women. No, he, he said that, um, that the women cannot be, um, cannot be a, a president of Belarus. Not because uh -huh. they're not allowed to, but because they don't have what it, what takes. it takes, you know. Okay. So, um, and actually, uh, this woman kind of met with uh, the wife of the second uh, uh, opposition nominee and the, the um, manager of the campaign of the third, and they had kind of a coalition, and all the opposition kind of united behind uh, Tikhanovska, and as far as we know, she won. And that's something that Lukashenko cannot acknowledge, possibly. I think psychologically, he cannot even admit it to himself. So uh, as far as we know, all the poll stations that uh, uh, has uh, real information, because we have real information of some of the poll stations, mm -hmm. um, she got between 60 and 70%. Now, wow. cor according to the official um, results, Lukashenko had almost uh, 80% and she got less than 10%. And nobody would ever believe that. If he would say that, okay, I won in like 59% and she got like 47, it might have been okay. But when he said she got like 9.9% .9 and I got 79.9% yeah. or something like that. Nobody believed the, that and the, people hit the streets on the very day of the elections. So his ego kind of is what took him down. I think so. He uh, well, he's not down yet. Yeah. <laughs> but but is yes, what, I think Is what so. caused this strong opposition. I think so. And so then, and these, is, is her husband still locked up? Yes. He's still locked up. Yes. And he was locked up, what, a year ago? Uh, no, a couple of months ago. A couple of months. Yeah, wow. before the elections. So she ran a campaign of only a few months. Yeah. Wow. The, the, the elections were in August, beginning of August, right? The, the 9th of August. Yeah, a month uh, ago. About uh, three weeks ago. Three so weeks then what happens? Now. So yeah, what's happening now, on so, the streets? So um, the, the very evening, the very night of the elections... Uh, after the, the official polls are going out, people are hit, uh, going to the streets um, to, to demonstrate against the fortification, uh, for the forging of the elections. And the, the police um, just, um, well, can, can we use a French kind of yeah, vocabulary? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So the police uh, pretty much beat the shit out of them. And <laughs> the thing is, um, in, in the last, in the, the first few wow. days, um, there were very severe police violence. 3,000 people 
were arrested on the first night along the second night 2,000 more the third night 2,000 more all of them were beaten constantly for the week of Jesus. for which most of them were arrested uh, they were locked uh, like 40 or 50 people in cells that meant for five people uh, most of them were tortured actually now if the the, the thing is that in Belarus um, they have really really um, good I would say well professional um, policing forces mm. now uh, and you gotta invest in your policing if you're a dictator exactly exactly <laughs> now I told you before the the show that I uh, had the chance to meet them uh, yeah. <laughs> tell us about that so the, the thing is <laughs> well it's um, I'm ashamed to say but uh, technically I, I was in Belarus only once Uh, I, I'm go I'm going to Eastern Europe all the time, but mostly it's Ukraine and sometimes Russia and Poland. But, uh, you know, mostly Ukraine because Ukraine is also Poland and Russia and other places and everything also is there. Also, it's just good practice to stay out of a dictatorship. Yeah, but, 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 you know, I, you know Be Belarus was in my to-do list because nobody pays attention to Belarus. And I felt for that, in that uh, as well because, you know, this is a small country and they're very quiet and keep to themselves. Anyway, but uh, I've been there once. And I had some problem with uh, my visa. And I was uh, taken with uh, my wife. We just married just before that. Uh, we were taking, uh, ta taken from the train in Belarus and deported. But before the train came from the other direction, we had to wait a few hours. So they uh, put us in a military base in a forest. And um, you land, you came there by train, yeah, from uh, from Ukraine, from Kiev. And um, so they took you from the train station yeah. to a military base in the Now, forest. The first surprise was that, of course, you know, I'm you know, a lot in Eastern Europe, so the first thing I kind of okay, so uh, how much uh, exactly, not, not how <laughs> much, but I kind of asked the the, 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 the woman that's in charge on the, on the train, okay, I, I can offer him something. She said, no, 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 these guys. They don't take bribes. So I was surprised. Oh, you were like, okay, I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yes. oh, Then shit. we kind of, they put us <laughs> in some place and they told us, okay, you sitting here are not moving until, you know, like six hours or so. Until It's never the next good when they out. take a Jew to the forest in Eastern Europe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and we had very, very nice, huge kind of guy with huge muscles guarding us all the time and um, he was very very polite very professional very frightening and the most frightening thing that was there is that you know the the, the, the kind of border well the border police people were uh, going to kind of um Um, you know, uh, they were called to a, I forgot the word, when, when you stand in line, you know, in the army or whatever, you know. Yeah, the drill, the, 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 uh, in the yeah, morning. The, yeah, yeah, so so, so they were called and um, I'm kind of, you know, I was in the Israeli army, so I know that everybody going to, okay, you know, they're calling us, so let's drag ourselves there. And they're kind of running and they're very happy and all of them are smiling. You know, and that was that was the most frightening thi thing because it's, like you know, it's a police state and you are the police. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> they're very happy. Uh, they're like kind of robots, you know, terminators. Anyway, so they have, you know, the, the ordinary police is kind of, you know, they, Lukashenko even doesn't use them much, but they have KGB. It's still called KGB in Belarus. Really? And Why kill a good brand? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and they so have their kind of special units. And they have another unit. What, uh, the, the, these are the guys that you see usually in, on you know, YouTube and whatever. Uh, that's called the uh, Omon, uh, which is a, a Soviet modeled riot police. And they're extremely hardcore. And they're very, very loyal. It's kind of village people kind of not this kind of village people but people from the villages they're kind of young people they're not very educated and indoctrinated kind of seriously indoctrinated the very big very strong very violent very disciplined and they are the ones that kind of their I, i would say um their job and that's official is to protect the regime you know they, they have an oath they will die for that they have an oath i The part of the oath, the oath, and with I'm loyal to the president and to the state, 
first the president, then the state. Mm-hmm. They, have, they have them in Russia as well. They used to have them in Ukraine, but they canceled it after the Ukrainian revolution in, in 2014. But in Belarus, they, I guess, did the most hardcore. Wow. So, so how did it end, the story? So, um, well, that's only the beginning. We're on the first day, <laughs> okay? So, but, you, but, you but were let's... there for a few days. No, I'm saying ah, about ah, the, the camp. My story, yeah. yeah. Well, well, eventually the, the train came and we went back to Kiev and, you know, there is a... The and story... you never came back to Belarus? Not yet. I was supposed to do so. And, wow. and then the corona came. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I don't know it well enough. But the thing is, most people don't, so I can pretend as if I'm an expert. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, um, so so let's divide the, the three weeks that we had uh, since the elections, okay? Yeah. Now, the, the first few days, or almost a week, uh, every night uh, people were out in the streets, the police just beat them, and you see a lot of kind of, uh, um, of uh, footage of... People, police just beating people that they saw on the street and not necessarily people who went to demonstrations and um, it was a lot a lot of police violence and on the second day uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya went uh, and this is kind of a, I would say quite a crazy story she went to um, to file a complaint official complaint uh, for the forging of the elections and she went to the office of the election committee And the head of the election committee left the office. Then two uh, KGB agents entered the office, stayed with her a few hours. She are going out of the office in the evening, saying to uh, her staff, I took my decision and disappears. Now, people were looking for her until kind of a few hours. And uh, the the next day she appeared uh, outside of of the country in uh, Lithuania. Uh, and then um, she... She ca- fled. Uh, I would say that she was forced to flee, and uh, she kind of uh, published a video from her cell phone. She uh, clearly traumatized. Um, most people think that uh, her husband who is in jail and her children. She took her children out of the country to Poland and hid them before the election. She knew what she's dealing with, Okay. So think about it. You you're running in as as a candidate in, in election, and you have to hide your children in another country because somebody can hurt them. Okay, so probably they were kind of um, uh, threatened. So she she was clearly traumatized and said that uh, I'm, I'm only a weak woman and uh, all this. Uh, you know, uh, it's not worth the violence and children is the the, the most important thing that we have, and also. Um, The regime kind of uh, published a a short film, which is referred as the hostage video, okay, where she was forced probably to to speak, you know, to read a statement in the office with the KGB people that she kind of calls to the people not to go and not to protest. And accept the election results? Yeah. Okay. Now, after she fled, uh, of course, she kind of uh, went back to uh, to kind of uh, to some kind of leadership position. And uh, but she she haven't told what happened in that room until now. She says that she won't talk about it for now. Uh, so, but but this th- was only two weeks ago, three weeks ago. It was three weeks ago. But uh, after the first few nights, where the plenty of violence and, and and stuff, and and the internet was shut down and things like that. Uh, when uh, it seems like, okay, that's the end of it, because in every election round, um, Belarus had some kind of a protest. It took like a day or two when the, the police just beat people, and that was the end of it. So after two days, it looks looked like, okay, that's, that's the end of it. And then, uh, three days after the election, in the morning, you had uh, women stepping out. Now, this is one of the things, you know, the, the, this, I would, I, would, I would call it revolution. This revolution is uh, kind of uh, soaked with gender, you know, issues, I would say. Because you're seeing that, that um, well, first of all, the, this dictator and his rival, which is a woman, and all the things that he said about women, etc., etc. But you see that um, you have a kind of 
chains of women dressed in white holding flowers for miles in throughout the country uh, and you know just when every everyone thought that that's the end these women kind of go to the street and we, we have uh, uh, women demonstrations every day against police violence um, and police cannot handle them you know it's, it doesn't really work the, the police because these thugs from the village they don't know what to do like well, to a lady yeah the, that, that's one thing the they second have this thing cognitive is the second thing is that uh, they have demonstrations all the time in many places uh, they call it uh, the, the partisan style uh, kind of demonstrations because um, the You know, if, if the police kind of disperse a big demonstration, so they have many small ones in different places and the, the police is running around and, and Lukashenko doesn't have as much uh, policemen to, to control all of that. You know, not, not enough policemen that actually trust. He don't want to, uh, to use the ordinary police because, you know, if you're a policeman in some town, you know, and you have some uh, people that are uh, going out to, to protest, you might have studied in the same school mm-hmm. with them. So you cannot trust them, okay? The, the army are uh, mandatory, ma- mandatory recruits. You cannot trust them as well. So you have only the KGB and Oman, okay? And there's just not enough of them to control the situation. How many now. people live in Belarus? Um, less than 10 million people. Okay. okay about nine and a half. And we have, he have only a few thousands of, you know, the trustworthy policemen. Now, um, uh, So why does, this, excuse me, but why don't the masses, if they are clearly more, uh, why don't they just charge and take over well, everything? That's one of the big questions. Um, because if there were Ukrainians, you know, <laughs> that's exactly what they would do and they just... would bury the dictator in some forest, and that would be the end of it. Uh, well, the beginning of it, because they're going to have a Russian invasion afterwards. But <laughs> um, the thing is that uh, these demonstrations are very, very nonviolent. I won't say that there was no violence at all from the, uh, from the opposition, but, but basically you have these masses of people And you have these uh, workers on strike. This is another thing that uh, is an insult for Lukashenko. The big factories went on strike. This is his base. I told you that he, he has kind of a fetish for uh, tractors. There is a huge tractor company uh, in Belarus that, you know, they're kind of the, the, the protege. They're the favorite of Lukashenko. He just adores their tractors. And, you know, he... It sounds and, like a child. Yeah. Like and Playing he, with tractors. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he went, in this factory went on strike. And Lukashenko came down to the factory to talk with the people, to the, with the workers. And, you know, he's there and, they say, and he said, okay, I know that in this place you always supported me. And they're shouting, no, we didn't, you know, <laughs> go the fuck out of here, you know, <laughs> you have to resign. And, and you see how insulted he is in, and he went to a demonstrator, start threatening, uh, threatening him, you know, said, you know, you, you, you want to fight, you know, <laughs> things like that. Really? Yeah. This and is on camera. On camera. This is incredible. But the thing is that nobody actually... laid a finger on him and we had ministers caught in the demonstrations and people shouted on them but nobody hit them okay so they very very nice and polite one of the kind of images of that revolution and you see sometimes kind of huge demonstration where people standing on uh, benches on the street and they take their shoes off to stand on the benches on the street in the middle of the demonstration Okay, so they're kind because, of... Because, because a gentleman doesn't step on a place where people sit, well, right? The reputation of Belarusians is that they're very polite, very quiet, very nice, very passive. That's, that's the kind of stereotype among mm-hmm. their neighbors. Um, and uh, and I, I guess it's kind of true because they actually, for three weeks now and more, they're going out the street every day. And uh, now the police kind of more careful about that, but 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 still it's it's dangerous. and um, and you know, they don't charge the the palace. Some uh, demonstrators went towards the palace a few days ago, and Lukashenko kind of um, 
was um, was filmed by his staff, but his new media staff that was imported from Russia, by the way, uh, as you know, going uh, around with a Kalashnikov to protect the palace from the from the from the riots. But you know, they just went there and stood the front in front of the policemen and play songs on, on the guitar and, and stuff like that. You know, so Lukashenko is see, sees this as kind of a weakness. The opposition would say, you know what, we, we are legitimate, we're non-violent, we're going to just keep going until you go. Mm-hmm. And Lukashenko said, okay, you know, they don't use violence, so I don't have a reason to go. So he clings so what to do his you, chair. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think do you think he's going anywhere? Do you think it's just this is going to kind of dissipate in another... How well, long is a term? I uh, guess five years. Five years. Well, the thing is that there are a few um, basics, uh, basic uh, facts here. One of them is uh, when you have the majority of the population that doesn't want that president. And for three weeks now, they're on the streets. And the, the, feeling, the, the, the feeling of freedom for the first time, okay? Uh, there is no way back, okay? Uh, you can't go to on, the previous situation. On, they say, Point of no return. Yeah, but yeah, you, you break an egg, you can't put it back. Yeah, right? yeah. They, they cannot, I think, accept the same kind of dictatorship. They cannot accept the Lukashenko as president. This is fact number one. Um, second fact is that uh, it doesn't mean they will, they will uh, succeed because um, what Lukashenko is doing now is calling for uh, Putin's help. Now, uh, Belarus, what's the relationship between them? Belarus and, and Russia are supposed to unite to one country, okay? Because remember the history that I told you about? If the opposition kind of uh, have this um, kind of uh, memory of history of them being part of Poland and Lithuania and, and Europe, and, and Lukashenko actually uh, blames Poland and Lithuania for meddling in Belarus and causing that revolution, uh, the narrative of Lukashenko and of Russia is that Belarus is part, part of Russia, of, of big Russia, of the Russian Empire. The same goes uh, with uh, Ukraine, with uh, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and etc., Armenia, etc. Et Mother okay. Russia. Exactly. They, they have kind of this, um, I would say, idea that they deserve to be an empire. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so... Um, what happened between Putin and Lukashenko is that uh, Russia and Belarus are supposed to be united sometime in the future. Officially. Yeah, officially to one state. Okay. But Lukashenko played a double game. Okay. Because if. He wanted to join the EU. No, he didn't want to join the EU, but he, he didn't want to, to be swollen by, by Russia as well because he's a dictator of his own country. So mm-hmm. why would you... So every time... That Life's Put- good as the uh, dictator. Exactly. So every time that Putin kind of pushed to some kind of integration, so for more integration, Lukashenko kind of, okay, let's become more friendly to the European Union. Mm-hmm. Okay? So um, in one hand... You know, he holds a gun to Putin's head, okay? If you push too much, I'm going to be friends with your enemies. On the other hand, if Belarus is going to try to join the uh, European Union, Russia will just invade. So Putin holds a gun to Lukashenko's head as well. So it's kind Interesting. of... Interesting. But can, can, would the EU ever uh, uh, accept a dictatorship? No. They, and, and, and that's, they uh, would that, just pretend it's uh, a democracy? And, and this is... The fact num- number two, okay? Um, every, what we see here is kind of a um, democratic revolution, okay? Mm-hmm. The people want democracy. Now, if you have democracy, um, by default, you are kind of um, going away from Moscow's orbit and you're closer to Europe. Because if Russia and Belarus are supposed to be united to one state, you can cannot have two political systems in, in, in one country. Mm-hmm. They tried it in, with uh, uh, China and uh, Hong Kong, and it didn't work. Okay, So, uh, so even though that uh, the opposition in Belarus is not against Russia, mm-hmm. you don't have a lot of anti-Russian sentiments in Belarus, the fact that the people want democracy... For Russia, this is a serious threat, okay? So what Lukashenko is trying to do is to convince Putin to help him, to send his troops, okay? To send his people. 
Uh, now, the question is that uh, will Putin do that? Because in one hand, okay, this is what he supposed to do because he needs to keep Belarus as part of his orbit, especially after he lost to Ukraine, you know. Yeah, it sounds like Ukraine number two, <laughs> basically. It sounds like a bad sequel, too. Well, it's a... Uh, I would say the, the thing with the sequel is very interesting because for uh, six years now, uh, Putin frightens his people in Russia from the Ukrainian scenario. Now, the, um, I guess we don't have the time to go to the details of the Ukrainian revolution, but uh, the pictures from that revolution were very tough. Harsh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, are we talking about the recent war in Ukraine? Not the war, but the revolution in Ukraine in 2014. Okay. Now, when the Ukrainians, you know, were beaten by their police at the time, they didn't give them flowers like the Belarusians. Okay. They, you know, kicked their asses. Okay, they just beat, beaten the police back and they, they had kind of this fortress in the middle of Kiev. And when the police tried to kind of breach it with tanks and everything, they just threw Molotov cocktail on them and they, they kind of defended themselves um, from the police. So uh, it doesn't matter what you think about it. Uh, the pictures are frightening. You see that, you see the fire and, you know, the bullets and people getting killed and... and Yeah, if, there is some if pretty... You kind of, yeah, yeah. And, and even if you don't like Putin much, you think, okay, you know, I don't like Putin, but I don't want that kind of mess in my country. Okay, so, so the, um, I would say that the um, strategy was to, to, to tell the Russian people, you want a revolution? That's what the revolution looks like, and you don't mm -hmm. want that. And then they have the pictures on the Belarusian revolution when you see kind of pretty women in white dresses handing flowers to the cops, okay? And that's more frightening because you cannot convince the people that there's something wrong with that. But Even Putin if you said that he will invade if, if he needs to. He said that uh, he had some people ready to help if uh, Lukashenko loses control, uh, if help. there was some kind of... <laughs> If yeah. there is some kind of uh, anarchy, if you have invasion from Poland or whatever, okay? Uh -huh. But but again, you he needs an excuse. And, and the thing is that the Russian invasion is very dangerous for Putin. It's extremely dangerous for him, okay? So we have the danger of invading and uh, facing more sanctions and mess and dealing with that He has enough problems as it yeah. is now with Corona. Now, with Corona, and I remind you that uh, many people don't understand that, but the invasion to Ukraine failed, okay? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it doesn't work. Because um, he's not sovereign there, but he's not out of there. He's yeah, stuck he's, there. Yeah, he's like kind of making Vietnam their, he, he makes their, their yeah. life miserable, but Ukraine is still friends with Europe. They yeah. never came back, okay? Uh, so so the, it sounds like a, an immovable... Uh, object meets a, an unstoppable force. It's so, like, is there any solution? You have here unstoppable force of the revolution. They're yeah. unstoppable, but they they're not exactly is, a force because they is there can't no chance that they'll pick up arms? You don't think that? They'll... I don't know. I don't know. But but for now, so uh, you have uh, Lukashenko that you know is still alive just because the revolutionaries are not violent. You have put in the things. Okay, I cannot lose Belarus. I cannot invade Belarus and my people seeing the the footage from there and they're saying, okay, it, it might be not such a bad idea to do such a revolution here at home. And he has problems in Siberia and you know other places. So so we have here a very complicated situation. Mm -hmm. And I would say that Putin, many, many people think that he's kind of very sophisticated chess player, but, but he's not, okay? And Putin is often kind of... Uh, Too impulsive. Very impulsive. Uh, personally, I think that the invasion to Ukraine was impulsive act uh, because he had better options. Right. And he can just be too terrified and just invade. And then you have, you know, a huge geopolitical crisis, you know. So, so, mm -hmm. so if you were to advise the rioters or the revolutionaries, if you were the leader, what would you do? Well, um, 
I would say pretty much the same things that, uh, well, they don't really have leaders, but, you know, if they, they have strike. some, but, but I would say do the same thing that you're doing, but do it more and do it for a long time. The, the thing is that they're kind of leaders, as far as they have uh, leaders, they're saying the same thing. They, they're saying, you know, it's going to take time. We're not going to take arms. We're going to just continue going out to the street, streets and do strikes until we... You know, I think things going to change. Is is and, it a feasible option that Lukashenko says, you know what, I'm leaving? Well, probably not. But but the thing is that in... in What's well, the in end game sh- here? In, that's the big questions. And you know, in the... In the nobody in- understood what's the end game. But I can say that in a few weeks or maybe months, but probably weeks, the economy is just going to collapse. Okay? You cannot uh, block the internet. Uh, yeah, but who to... does that, that hurts the most, the, the citizens, right? I mean, so it's like, in the end, it feels like they're almost going to push themselves to arms. Because in the eventually, Might like, be. it's like in the, in the American doctrine, there's four basic rights for people. And one of it's revolution, right? The right, I mean, that's what America yeah. was founded on, right? The ability to, or the right to take up arms and to take down tyranny. Well, Eventually you have to, like if you were being... The thing is that if, if they're going to take arms, that um, they will make sure that uh, Russia will invade. I think mm-hmm. uh, there, there's no option for them to take arms and to Russia not to invade. Is okay? there anybody on the other side of the aisle that would the EU, would NATO, would someone well, help out the Belarusians? Why would they didn't help <laughs> Ukraine? Well, they, they did help a little bit, but not enough. Uh, usually they kind of, uh, they're very concerned of the situation, but they don't, you know, uh, send enough help. Um, the thing is that Europe um, would prefer that none of it will ever ha- happen because Lukashenko was convenient for them as well. Lukashenko was in the Belarus were, were a back channel to doing business with Russia. You cannot sell Russia stuff because there the, you have sanctions, but you can't sell Belarus, and Belarus is going to sell it to Russia. Mm. How convenient, okay? <laughs> so um, and the Europeans would love to go back to business with Russia. Not because it's a good idea to have business with Russia, but because personally, for politicians, for senior kind of economical figures, it's very good for them personally to do business with Russia. Because if you do business with Russia, they uh, give you different kind of presents. Okay, they take you to Siberia to hunt exotic animals and to go to the sauna, and they hire prostitutes for the, for you. So and. And after you retire, you have a chair in some kind of a, a board of an oil company or whatever. So if you're like European... Joe politi- Biden's son. Exactly. If you, <laughs> well, Joe Biden's son is kind of the... the, the I would say he, he got, you know... He's a peon. It, 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 yeah, exactly. That was in Ukraine. It's kind of... This is a small yeah. change, okay? Think about uh, the former um, German... Um, Prime Minister, I think, about the head of the... Now they have a scandal in... Uh, in Switzerland, in the, with the, the head of the um, the general, uh, well, I'm not sure how, what was the term there, but an the, important guy in Switzerland, yeah, the, the, the guy that is supposed to kind of, uh, well, I forgot the word. Anyway, so um, so the thing is that the Europeans would love to go back to business with, uh, with Russia, and they kind of figured out, okay, people are forgetting about Ukraine, so we can start going back to, and inviting back to the G7, and et cetera, et cetera. And now they have Belarus, and they say, okay, so, you know, how hypocrite can we be? We cannot say that we're against democracy and supporting the dictator, so we have to make some sounds and send some kind of help and maybe do some sanctions. <laughs> uh, and good old classic uh, Europe. Exactly. Exactly. So they, they kind of dragged <laughs> in. Nobody helps the. Exactly. So uh, I, I said about this, you know, kind of a geopolitical, I would say, a collision. But aren't there sanctions now on? Like there are some sanctions of uh, Lithuania and uh, Poland, and the rest of uh, Europe uh, talks about some kind of sanctions. They're moving, but very slowly. The, the 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 thing is that the most important thing is you have here, you know, people. You know, 10 million people that n- most people never heard about him that just want to have a free country and a decent life. That's it. And because of them, you have kind of this huge geopolitical crisis. You can't have... you can have domino effect. Yeah, you, you can't have a huge war because of that. And, you know, just because these people wanted their freedom and nobody cared. But I feel like 
all of history and the world is listening to you say that and saying story of my life yeah right i mean like that's how we we were all we all just wanted like a happy little corner of the earth to live freely and then that's like what brought on (laughs) all these wars and revolutions and so i don't know it's interesting do you think last question do you think the system can be changed from within or is that like can maybe i don't know lukashenko get old die and someone else come along and 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 do reforms or like is there a peaceful way out of this well usually i would say that no there isn't but if there is a place that can figure out how to 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 do it peacefully it's belarus because again you have like police beating people in the street and just smashing car, random cars on the street and arresting and torturing 7,000 people. And the next thing that happens in the next day after this brutal kind of, you know, uh, crackdown, you have women in white dresses with flowers that, and they're handing them to policemen and yeah. hugging them. So if somebody can figure, why, uh, figure a way, a, a peaceful way, out of this crisis, I guess this is the Belarusian people because <laughs> you know, I guess they have some kind of culture that uh, uh, that might facilitate that uh, yeah. and might not. Well, here's the hoping. Yeah. By the way, it's also there's uh, it's not just tortures and arrests. There's there's deaths. Yeah. I mean, there's a, if you look at Wikipedia, there's just a long list of people that were that died in these protests. So well, it's pretty it, awful. It's not lo- long list uh, for now, but uh, I mean, it's tens, tens of people. But no? we have you have tens of people that uh, disappeared. Yeah. Now, no, but there's people few, who few, got you know. You a, have um, at least two people that disappeared, and the, then their bodies were found in a forest. Yeah, and they must have tripped in the forest. Yeah. You, have, you have like <laughs> they went mushroom picking, and, <laughs> and you have few dozens of people that are not accounted for because no, it's they're just awful. We're talking about taking the police, and nobody knows what happens. So yeah. Anyway, just a uh, you know makes anybody you appreciate. who's yeah makes you appre- I, well, that's a good way. I, maybe <laughs> we should say it more subtly. Yeah, makes you appreciate what you have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know the, the for uh, kind of the ending of that is that. I think that we in in the West, well, I'm not sure Israel is West, but in in the Western world, I think we don't appreciate what we have. And uh, we have this democracy and, you know, we we kind of, I don't know, I think we throwing it away because, you know, and you see that the peoples of Eastern Europe in in Belarus and Ukraine and and Russia and Georgia and Armenia, they're fighting for the basic things that we have. To us, it's obvious. And we don't cherish, okay? Also, so. uh, so I think we, they, they need our attention and our support and maybe they can remind us a few things that we have forgotten. To get a bit political, you know, it, it's a lesson about like, don't be easy to call uh, when you say it's a dictatorship, it's where, you know, all that talk that we hear. That also we in just America. talked about a few days ago on yeah. our podcast. Yeah, like uh, with whom? When we when we said that we discovered about the emergency state law, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. so it, I mean, there's problems, and it's important to have a good opposition, I think, in democracy. But but be careful before you call the state you live in unfree. Yeah, yeah. Wow, Shalom. Thank what can so we much. plug? Uh, you give lectures, so if people want you on their Zoom. They can co- reach out f- for lectures yeah, and sure. like Jewish communities abroad. Yeah, well, my um, most of my work right now, since I'm not a uh, guiding kind of uh, study tours in Eastern Europe. Uh, How come? So, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, I'm... Uh, Kind of, I, I'm giving lectures about usually Jewish history. Mm. Did you know that about 80% of the Jews in the world lived in Eastern Europe, especially in Belarus and Ukraine? And we remember very little about them. So this is my passion for the last few years wow. to tell the untold stories about the biggest group in Jewish history ever. Of course, like about 80 or 90% of the American Jewry is from Eastern Europe. And most people, that I met there, don't exactly know from where. Yeah, my family came. I'm not sure if it's Russia or Poland or Ukraine, maybe Belarus, maybe some, maybe Austria. Um, and it was kind of a, you know, a filter on the roof kind of places. And it's you funny, know, was, we, we lost a... the memory of our history. And this history is fascinating. 
Yeah. So that's yeah. awesome. I was I was just gonna say I was at a wedding and the rabbi was marrying. Uh, he's a good friend of the uh, groom's father, and he was like, uh, oh, he was telling a story. Oh, there's somewhere from some somewhere from there in Germany. And the grandmother was behind him, and she's like, uh, Poland. <laughs> like, okay. It's all the same. Yeah. Well, after the first of September is the same. <laughs> <Yeah>. So. <laughs> so yeah. how can people reach out to you? Um, by Facebook, Twitter, I have. Let's spell your name. Patreon Y. Okay, so guys, get a piece of paper and a pen. <laughs> yeah, well, how to space? Uh, how to spell uh, Shalom? I guess you know it's uh, easy enough. About the surname, it's B O G U S L A V S K Y. Okay. So Boguslavski. Yeah. So that's my name on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, Patreon, and oh, that's, you have a that's Patreon. My, yeah. But uh, for now, it's oh. only Hebrew lectures, but I can okay. do English one as well. Awesome. Um, and uh, of course, this is my email, you know, shalom.boguslavsky at gmail. So. Perfect. Amazing. We'll put links, guys. Thank you very much. It was fascinating. Thank very, you very, so very much for coming. Before we go, first of all, we want to thank Karen Klein from our team. Yes, for thank helping you, us Karen. Out. You're amazing. Also, also, we just started a collaboration with the sponsorship. Forward. Uh, sorry, the sponsorship with the Forward. Check them out, theforward.com. Uh, the go number to the one. forward.com slash 2NJB to get an exclusive offer for just podcast listeners. Six months for 10 bucks. Okay, that's like 67% off. Theforward.com. They're an amazing source for Jewish news, politics, commentary. Check them out, theforward.com slash 2NJB. Also, Ruth Sheva, israelnationalnews.com. Check them out for uh, news and articles in English yes. about Israel. And also the Australian Jewish news, ajn.timesofisrael.com for an Australian angle on the Jewish world. If it interests you, go. And lastly, yeah. we uh, do this on a free time. So if you want to help us out, guys, to njb.com slash donate. That is it. Shalom. Thank you so much for coming Thank all you. the way from Jerusalem. We appreciate it. Yes, very much. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Good night.